Uh, many thanks to the organizers for bringing me back to Santa Barbara and for bringing all of us here. It's lovely to see all of you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about isometries. I wasn't expecting for Tom to talk about isometries as well just before this. Um, uh, we've talked so far, various people have talked about anti de Sitter. He's going to talk about flat space. Um, so we're talking about de Sitter today. Um, the, this talk is based on a pre-pandemic paper uh, co-authored with Jordan Kotler. Um, it will appear in parts, as well as a, a new work that's going to appear on the scale of days. Uh, but I didn't want to curse myself, so I left an ambiguous archive number. Um, so this is a talk about an interplay between three things. It may take a little bit to see the connection, but bear with me a moment. So the, the three kind of interweaving themes of this talk are time evolution, Hilbert space and the S matrix of the center quantum gravity. The old sort of thing I want to, to start with is, uh, well, you can pose the sort of thought experiment in uh, Einstein gravity with positive cosmological constant coupled to matter. You know, you can formulate initial conditions in the very, very far past with a really, really big universe, um, say some infalling matter, in such a way that under evolution, the space-time geometry crunches. It goes from being big and non-singular to very small and singular. And you might wonder, what are the fate of these initial conditions in the quantum theory? And there have been musings over these years that, you know, such states, uh, such initial conditions, they, they don't correspond to states in the bulk Hilbert space of de Sitter gravity. And perhaps this is even a mechanism by which the Hilbert space of de Sitter gravity might be rendered finite dimensional, finite entropy. Um, it sounds all plausible, but it's actually very provocative if it's true. These initial conditions I have in mind, you will prepare them in asymptotia in the far past, where you know the, there's a you know there's a Hilbert space of such configurations where I have a really really big uh, asymptotic universe. So there's some and you know, the such initial conditions would live in a Hilbert space I construct there. Call that H asy for H asymptotic, um, but somehow those states would not live in the bulk Hilbert space. And how does this all work? How do these things fit together? So you could ask under evolution, um, I guess that's the, yeah, under evolution, what happens to such initial states? Well, the rest of this talk is kind of uh, working this out. What's the fate of these crunching initial conditions? And what do they imply for how these things talk to each other? Evolution, asymptotic Hilbert space, bulk Hilbert space, and the S matrix. And to proceed uh, with more than just pictures, I want to compute things. We need some reliable framework for de Sitter gravity. Well, um, let's do JT gravity, or at least it's de Sitter version. Um, and at the end, I'll have some comments about uh, a very brutal, uh, just some, some new things to say about a mini superspace approximation of Einstein gravity. The main result uh, for this talk is that at least in, in JT gravity, um, well, we can talk about evolution from the bulk, is what I mean here, times running up in this picture, to future infinity, that that evolution is isometric rather than unitary. There's a, in, so my two Hilbert spaces here that I have in mind, like in, in Tom's V, are, well, different than Tom's V, but there's, there's two Hilbert spaces. There's a bulk Hilbert space of states I can prepare here. There's an asymptotic one living in infinite future. I'm going to call the operator that takes me from one to the other V because U is going to be reserved for something else. Um, and this V has two defining properties, V dagger V, which takes me up and then back. It's the identity. V V dagger, which turns out takes me from far past to far future. That's what we would normally call the evolution operator over an infinite amount of time. That's going to be a projector as opposed to the identity. And the, the main mechanism by which this takes place is the fact that, well, okay, we're going to proceed in path integral formulation where we sum over smooth metrics. So this truncation from, you know, evolution being unitary to evolution being a projector, at least over infinite time, is going to come because we're only going to sum over smooth metrics. And at, at the end, we'll find um, really just a suggestion that uh, for how this picture might be realized in higher dimensions. So plan for the rest of the talk. I guess I'm talking quickly, so maybe I'll, I'll end early. Probably not. Um, I, I gave my introduction already. 
most of the rest is going to be about the sitter JT. Uh, there'll be some annoying subtleties that we'll have to deal with. Uh, and then I'll have a few slides about mini superspace and then just some couple parting thoughts. <sighs> okay, so where we begin, this is um, the de Sitter version of JT gravity, um, studied a few years ago by in papers of Juan, Joaquin, and Jen Ben Yang, and then also myself with Jordan and Alex Maloney. Um, you know, like uh, like its ADS cousin, it's a theory of constant curvature metrics. Has a its field content is a metric g mu nu and a dilaton phi. As in uh, ADS, the dilaton enforces that the, the curvature is constant. I want to talk about the sitter instead of anti the sitter. So I have phi r minus 2 instead of plus 2. It's a boundary term that's required. Uh, you can think of uh, it as following from the de Sitter version of holographic normalization or from having uh, you know, a consistent variational principle with asymptotically de Sitter boundary conditions, which will appear on the next slide. Basic feature of this model is the, the you know, just solve the equations of motion, look at the global solutions, just to get some intuition for what we're dealing with. Um, while the, you know, the metric in that case is just going to be that of, uh, you know, maximally symmetric, well, sorry, uh, uh, constant curvature manifold. Um, I have in mind, uh, you know, there's time and there's going to be a spatial circle. So the space time topology is that of a cylinder and well, the, what are constant curvature metrics on the cylinder? They're of this form. They're labeled by a parameter alpha, unlike in higher dimensions. Like in higher dimensions, if I talk about the sitter, there's just a, with a, say, a, a spherical universe, there's just a unique such geometry. It's maximally symmetric. Um, in this case, you know, X can have, if you will, the X could have any periodicity that you want. The, there's no curvature associated with the circle. So you can have constant curvature for any size of that circle that you want. That leads to, you can think of that as a modulus in the, the moduli space of constant curvature metrics, however you want to talk about it. As parameter alpha labeling these geometries, um, these are, you can think of them as, as bounce cosmologies, where the universe goes from really, really big in the far past to really, really big in the future, and you hit a minimum size, a bottleneck size, and that's what this alpha controls. Um, and then there's some dilaton profile on top of this that solves the equations of motion labeled by a constant. <clears throat> and well, the reason why we're going to study this model is because, as you know, by now you've probably seen some number of talks about JT gravity. It's a simple model. It has no propagating degrees of freedom, but it's not completely content-free. It has moduli, as is usually the case, um, but it also has propagating degrees of freedom on the boundary. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm as boundary excitations, Schwartzian degrees of freedom. Now, um, I should, uh, let's talk a little bit about those Schwartzian degrees of freedom, um, as well as the boundary conditions at play here. So, previous slide, this is the sort of classical solutions. We want to sum over everything. So, let's take a look at a, a snapshot just of a future part of the geometry near asymptotia. Needed to find my boundary conditions after all. What do I mean? What kind of boundary conditions am I going to impose? What do I mean by an asymptotically de Sitter region? Well, what I mean is a, a line element like this, where um, you can imagine plopping down a uh, boundary at fixed time. That will just be a large circle parameterized by x. And then there's some dilaton profile. Dilaton grows exponentially with some potentially spatially dependent profile uh, multiplying that. That's what I mean by uh, asymptotically to consider uh, boundary conditions. And the action I wrote down on the previous slide is consistent with those. Now, in the, the previous works that I mentioned, you know, we were all looking at um, the case where the, the, the simplest possible thing that you can do where you're, you force your dilaton to go to a constant. But if we're interested in to consider gravity, well, that, that future boundary, it's space-like. So fixing boundary conditions there really fixes a state in the asymptotic Hilbert space, and we want that to allow that to be anything, anything period. And the most general such state is characterized by the most general possible value of the renormalized dilaton there. We have to, if we want to be totally general, which we didn't do a few years ago, 
um, then we should allow for completely general boundary conditions there. And the statement is, is once we do that, well, that prepares a state labeled by this uh, profile for the dilaton at future infinity. And if you analyze um, how to say, uh, you know, it's very similar to how things work in anti de Sitter space. Uh, if you, there's a, a residual boundary degree of freedom. You can think of it as a wiggly boundary. Um, you could think of it as large gauge transformations consistent with these boundary conditions, what have you. Um, there's an extra degree of freedom associated with a boundary that you can think of as a reparameterization of the boundary, f of x. It's an element of diff s1 mod u1 in general. Um, and it gets weighted by some action. It's an e to the is. The action is a Schwarzian action. The parameter, sort of the bottleneck size that you're dealing with appears in the action as well. And then the renormalized dilaton sits out front. And what we want to do going forward is we want to analyze, uh, you know, transition amplitudes between states with uh, different values of this, uh, you know, different uh, dilaton states. Now, before doing so, we have to pause. I said that, um, that there's all these states that I can prepare with different values of the dilaton, but uh, hold on. Um, that, that's overcounting by quite a bit. Turns out that there's, uh, there's a redundancy in the bulk. There are large diffeomorphisms that relate configurations with different um, boundary states to each other. So there, you know, what you have to say, we've often experienced it in ADS CFT where there are asymptotic symmetries that uh, preserve the boundary conditions and they lift to global symmetries of the, the boundary theory. Well, in this case, there are large diffeomorphisms. They act all the way out on the boundary. They preserve the asymptotic metric, but not the dilaton. And so what those do is those relate uh, states with uh, different profiles for the dilaton uh, to each other. Um, here's the, the actual mapping. Uh, the, those transformations out of the boundary, they're parameterized in terms of a reparameterization of the circle, just a change of coordinate. Um, but the dilaton gets uh, scaled as well. There's some, it carries some non-trivial weight. And what these transformations do um, they preserve a certain, uh, a certain integral condition, essentially because this is a reparameterization. So what you would expect then is, okay, well, we, if we're being proper in general, that we should look at uh, these uh, most general boundary states characterized by general profile for the dilaton, but there should be some redundancy in that description. We can see that very explicitly. Um, we can, something that we can compute uh, building on what we did a few years ago um, is the inner product of these asymptotic states. That's what kind of tells us whether or not we're dealing with a redundancy or not. So what we can do is we can compute uh, the, the inner product between a state characterized by some e to the phi one, that's gonna give me my bra, and then a state uh, e to the phi two, that's gonna give me my ket, and the way we're going to compute that inner product is by regarding it as the, the imagine take, inserting an evolution operator in between with some amount of time t, and then send t to zero, in which case evolution becomes the identity. And from the path integral point of view, well, effectively what we do is we compute this inner product by summing over uh, metrics that uh, fill in uh, two asymptotic circles where instead of being one being far in the future and one in the past, but they're both in the future. They're very close to each other. Um, that gives us a non-trivial answer. In turn, uh, it's related, uh, it's determined in terms of the Schwarzian path integral. Uh, how to say that? And then there's some moduli space integral. It's similar to double trumpet. If you want to know details, I can tell you. Long story short, um, in order to compute it, we need this Schwarzian path integral with a non-trivial dilaton. Fortunately, that was computed by, and it appears in Appendix C, I was informed uh, by Luca in the room of uh, Douglas's paper with Edward from uh, 2017, in the context of, uh, so I, I've written analogous result if we're talking about a Schwarzian uh, theory where we're dealing with an integration space diff S1 mod U1. Um, the, Basic result is that this integral, in order to exist, uh, this, this quantity, um, this renormalized dilaton, e to the phi, in the Euclidean setting, it has to be always positive, always non-zero, always uh, greater than zero. 
Um, and then in that case, uh, there's a quantity, I'm calling it phi inverse, it's like the Fourier zero mode of e to the minus phi. The path integral with non-trivial dilaton is just proportional to the one with a constant dilaton. More geometrically, there's a large diffeomorphism in ADS that straightens out the dilaton. Once you know it got to always be non-negative, you can straighten it out with a diffeomorphism. That value is log this phi, and the path integral picks up an extra uh, prefactor on top of it. You can almost think of it as like an anomaly under this transformation. But it purely uh, depends on this, uh, this, back, this dilaton phi. So we use that then, and we compute this inner product of asymptotic states. We get some result, has a delta function in it, saying that the, you know, our configuration here has a big phi, this one has a big phi, um, and then there's a face. I said earlier that there should be some huge redundancy in the spectrum of asymptotic states. That, it turns out, is reflected in this uh, expression here. For any phi 1 and phi 2 with the same zero mode, this thing that's preserved under these uh, large diffeomorphisms, you can construct a null state, which is the superposition of the two. And then, if we do the usual thing, build a Hilbert space by quotienting out uh, under addition by null states, what this means then is you would identify e to the phi 1 with e to the phi 2 if they have the same big phi. And in practice, that means we can identify any state with a varying dilaton with one with a constant dilaton. And then it suffices to work with the space of um, constant dilaton external states. Long story short, our asymptotic Hilbert space is built from superpositions of these states where dilaton is constant. And in particular, it can be positive or negative. Our dilaton can go to some positive value or to negative value at asymptotia. There's a non-trivial inner product. The square root uh, arises essentially from these uh, Schwarzian modes. And to proceed, what we do is we canonically normalize the external states so as to have a normal delta function inner product. So we rescale by square roots. The two basic objects that you then get with these normalized asymptotic states are the wave function at future infinity of the JT version of no boundary state. This is like the hartle hawking wave function at infinity, um, prepared by some Euclidean cap, some hemisphere, and then evolve it to the future. Um, the unnormalized version of this already appeared in uh, earlier work of Juan and Joaquin and Jenbin and myself and Jordan and Alex. The normalized version looks like this. Um, when I say normalized, I mean with normalized external states. This wave function, you look at it, you think about it as a wave function on phi, it's non-normalizable. So that's interesting. That's a little different about JT than in higher dimensional gravity. In higher dimensional gravity, the hartle hawking wave function is normalizable, at least to, to one loop. Um, but the other main thing that you can compute, and this is kind of the, what is going to be more important for the talk, is the transition amplitude between you know, a large uh, universe in the far past and large universe in the far future, labeled by some value of the dilaton in the past, some label in the future. And the answer that you get after stripping off these uh, factors of square roots is very simple. It just, just looks like this. Um, there's a difference in phi's. Uh, the pole in this answer just corresponds to the global de Sitter saddle itself, kind of like how poles and propagators correspond to on-shell configurations. And the I epsilon is required in order to make the, the moduli space integral that you need to compute for this thing to render that moduli space integral convergent. Now, that answer might look a little familiar. Um, if we change basis, thinking of phi as a position, and I'm going to introduce a conjugate momentum P, we Fourier transform this amplitude, it's nothing more than a theta function, which amounts to saying that the infinite time evolution operator from far past to far future at least in this basis, uh, the, this momentum basis, or momentum-like basis, this P basis, it's a projector. It says that this thing has to be positive. Not one, and it's, it's not, which is clearly not unitary. And the, the, the kind of, uh, oh, um, this was a result that we already had a few years ago. 
And the goal of the next few slides is to understand what on earth is, is going on here from a bulk point of view. And this is the isometric evolution that I was mentioning at the beginning. Yes, Luca. Uh, so the associated momentum is a peloton that takes an acceleration. Yeah. Um, what's the meaning of the, that result of that perspective? The fact the, that this is what we're getting into in the next. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we want to figure out what, well, I have some picture that we can hold on to in our hands a bit more for, for what's going on here for this projection. And so what we're going to do is take kind of, um, take, uh, quantize JT, say more directly, we're going to fix a, a gauge and we're going to sum over metrics and dilettantes. So let's fix a kind of temporal gauge where we set, we're interested in space times that are topologically a cylinder, so we can always do this where we have uh, you know, some time kind of going up the cylinder and then our spatial circle has a non-trivial warp factor, I'm calling it A, we should integrate over A and the dilaton. Um, well, there's a field redefinition for JT, if we do this, um, that brings the action into PQ dot form. The, the change of variable is what I wrote here, we're gonna, this calligraphic Q, math cal Q is just the dilaton over A dot, um, and then this, this calligraphic P is A squared minus A dot squared. And, well, what, what's going, okay, if we have an action, if we have a quantum mechanical system with action PQ dot, this is an empty theory, there's no dynamics here, and we can prepare states of fixed Q or fixed P, and it, you know, there's a conservation law, right? There's no dynamics. If we fix Q, at least at large time, well, this Q, it's um, dilaton over A dot, uh, asymptotically, A tends to E to the T, in which case, um, and the dilaton also scales as E to the T. So in other words, this Q at very large time just tends to this, what I call renormalized dilaton. So states of, what are we, what kind of state are we fixing if we fix Q at least at late time? Well, that's a, one of these asymptotic states where we fix them or normalize dilaton. So fixing Q is, is something we've already seen. That's fixing the dilaton. What happens if we do the other thing and fix what I'm calling P? That prepares the state, um, I could call it a, a cat P of X. Um, what happens then? Well, um, there's no dynamics. So P is conserved quantum mechanically. P is just a function of the warp factor. And so if I know that it's conserved, I can completely reconstruct the space-time geometry. I get a superposition of e to the t and e to the minus t. Um, with, well, and uh, since p is conserved at each x in the way that I've done things here, there's some free functions of x multiplying both of those. Now it turns out that there are some residual diffeomorphisms, ones that preserve this uh, temporal gauge that I've written, that kind of straighten out the C plus and C minus in such a way as to render them constant, um, in which case the P of X that I find is constant, and then there, there's basically two possible values for it. I can get a positive one or a negative one. I won't talk, you know, okay. and there can be zero, but let me talk about positive and negative. Um, configurations with positive uh, P are very simple metrics indeed. They're just the, the things I wrote down earlier, global, two-dimensional de Sitter space. They're bounce cosmologies. I, you know, my warp factor goes like cost squared, so I have a big circle, goes to finite size, big circle again. Um, if P is negative, well, I, I get a geometry and where instead of cost squared, I have cinch squared. That's a crunch. Start off with a universe and it comes to, and it crunches at uh, T equals zero. It's a singular space time. Well, my bulk Hilbert space that I would naturally construct by this is built from superpositions of these uh, states of definite P. But the restriction to smooth geometries is going to only keep the bouncing cosmologies, not the crunch ones. So that's going to truncate me to these states of uh, positive P. And then the fact that there's no dynamics, what I would expect holds is that there's some uh, convention of boundary terms and so on, some normalization of states, so that bulk evolution is uh, just the identity. H is zero. Um, this is almost what we had before, 
Well, it's basically what we had before reconstructed from the boundary. Um, but let me, and which we're going to see on the next slide. Um, let me just note, though, that these uh, these states that I'm re these geometries that I'm reconstructing, these positive p things. Well, they are global to sitter geometries where the identification was that this p is is what I called alpha squared earlier, which was really labeling the bottleneck size. So fixing that my state is is some definite p bigger than zero amounts to saying, well, I, I have a bottleneck and I'm fixing the size of the bottleneck. This is giving me another way of, of fixing that. Uh, it's, you know, it's a state in the Hilbert space of the bulk. And now here's kind of putting it all together. We want to uh, discuss this map from bulk Hilbert space to boundary Hilbert space, um, which I claim is isometric. Calling that operator V, well, I can characterize it by computing its matrix elements. I'm going to take, you know, just matrix element most general possible initial state, most labeled by P, most general possible finite sta uh, final state, labeled by some renormalized dilaton. And, well, what is that thing? Well, that's what this, uh, the Desitter version of a trumpet in JT gravity, where I'm fixing a bottleneck size initially, and I'm fixing the dilaton up here. And we know what that is. Um, once I normalize the external state up here, that's nothing more than a phase factor. And with the conventions I picked, it's just e to the i phi p. You were Fourier transform, and what that tells us is that the state calligraphic p, well, I, it gets sent to a state in the boundary Hilbert space with a little p that's the same value. In other words, asymptotically, I had this, you know, I labeled my states by p, if I divide them into positive and negative, and I just restrict my attention to positive p, this operator v, bulk to asymptotia, just acts as the identity. Just map, it's just it trivially maps onto those states. Um, but it doesn't hit the states of negative p, the ones that correspond to crunching cosmologies. This is enough to verify that uh, v is an isometry as advertised. V dagger of V, so you go up and then down again, that's the identity. But on the other hand, V dagger V, which amounts to starting from a past to the future, is a projector. It's not one. And what is the projector? Well, it's onto, basically onto these geometries that don't crunch. And as an aside, um, something we can do then is, is we, in terms of hartle hawking physics, we have this non-normalizable wave function at future infinity for hartle hawking state. We can use uh, V to bring it back to a state at the bottleneck. And then it's actually very simple from the point of view of, of uh, state at the bottleneck. It's, it's delta function localized to um, this, what I'm calling this parameter P is equal to one. This is also non-normalizable from, uh, from the bulk point of view. Okay, so that's JT gravity. A few thoughts about mini superspace. Okay, um, we want to get, say something about higher dimensional gravity. The picture that we've advertised is a simple one, that the restriction to the sum over smooth geometries is what accomplishes this. Uh, it gives us kind of a, a language to talk about the fate of these crunching initial conditions. There's a different Hilbert space at asymptotia than the bulk, and evolution is isometric. But the real key player was this thing that we, you know, we sum over smooth geometries in the path integral formalism. And of course, we do that in higher dimension just as well as in lower dimension. We want to, to see if we can get some mileage out of that mechanism in higher dimensional gravity. So we're going to, okay, we lose control, computational control, once we leave the land of JT, but oh well. Um, as a first step, a real baby step, we're going to work in a brutal approximation where we just talk about the quantum mechanics of the scale factor. So we have our spatial universe being a sphere. <coughs> we again fix a temporal gauge like what we did before, and we just talk about a scale factor. It depends on time. We're going to quantize that system. It's been done before. You'll see the new ingredient here shortly. Um, you know, it's, it's well known. You can uh, perform a rescaling such that the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, for the scale factor just looks like a point particle action with an upside-down kinetic term and an upside-down potential. 
where it looks, okay, if you want all the details, it looks like this. Um, but, well, that's misleading because there's also GTT lying around, or equivalently the Hamiltonian constraint, which sets uh, an extra condition that the, the like energy that you would have for this point particle is zero. And that leads you to global de Sitter space. However, where that Hamiltonian constraint really comes from, is, as I said, is the GTT equation of motion implicitly. Um, what I wrote before, we, we've gauge fixed. You know, it, if we're gonna do a path integral in quantum gravity, we have to fix a gauge to make sense of what we're doing. We have to fix GTT as part of that gauge fixing, um, which implicitly requires an auxiliary field lambda that couples linearly to GTT. And the point is, is that that field, that, that X, well, it modifies the GTT equation of motion so that there's a right-hand side. Um, so that the actual uh, constraint of the gauge fix theory is, well, this, this thing that we would call an energy can be any constant value, actually. And where, if you will, the mismatch between um, this and zero is supported by the auxiliary field. The auxiliary field picks up a BEV. And I'm gonna pick a funny convention where there's, there's a minus sign here and you'll see why on the next slide. This is the new wrinkle. So quantizing then, we have a Hilbert space spanned by states of fixed E. And while well, that E, it's just a functional of, it's just a function of X and X dot. So once you fix E, you can reconstruct the corresponding space-time geometry. You can reconstruct what A, the scale factor is. And, well, the, what does this potential look like if we're talking about, you know, say, d four plus one, that potential looks like this. Um, it goes up and then comes down. Um, well, constant energy, you, we can go back and think about freshman physics and look at constant energy trajectories in such a context. Um, there's those things where the energy is down here. That would be positive energy for these funny conventions I've introduced. Um, these would correspond to geometries where the scale factor goes from being really big in the far past to some finite uh, minimum value and then blows up again. So those are bounce cosmologies that are different from global de Sitter, but they still represent, I would claim, states in the spectrum of the bulk Hilbert space. There's other configurations, those with lower energy, where the scale factor comes in from infinity and then shrinks to zero. Those would be crunches. Claim that the sum over smooth geometries should exclude those. In the same way that things happen in De Sitter, and that gives me a mechanism uh, within the path integral formulation for truncating uh, the, the bulk Hilbert space. And this is a very, very coarse-grained truncation. One might hope that the full one leads to a finite dimensional Hilbert space instead of a you know, an infinite dimensional one, but one thing at a time. I don't think I can do the more complicated thing. Anyway, um, so to recap, we studied this interplay between Hilbert space of asymptotic states, bulk states, evolution, and de Sitter JT gravity. There's, as in higher dimensional gravity coupled matter, there are initial conditions just in JT that crunch. Those are projected out under evolution. We saw that uh, you know, talking about things, evolution in terms of isometry gave us the language to be able to discuss this projection. Evolution from the bulk to future infinity being a projector, Hilbert space the bulk states being different from the ones that we prepare in the S matrix. We also talked about some technical details regarding uh, the Hilbert space of asymptotic states. Um, what's something that I'm doing with this in the future? Well, with Jordan and my student, uh, William Harvey, something that we're, we're working out is uh, sort of a related computation in higher dimensional gravity. Um, we're considering the hartle hawking wave function at future infinity of the no boundary state in 3D gravity and 4D gravity. Um, that has some um, saddle point approximation where the, what am I fixing? I'm fixing the metric at future infinity. That's I'm studying the wave functional, it's a functional of that metric. And, well, we can compute the norm squared of that state at future infinity. And if evolution is at least isometric, if not even unitary, then 
that result better be the norm of the Hartle-Hawking state in the bulk, which is the sphere partition function. And what we're doing is, is we're testing this relation to one loop. This provides a, a one loop test, if you will, of at least isometric evolution in Sitter quantum gravity. Um, that's all I got. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Kristen. Questions, comments? Okay, I will go first back. Yeah, thanks for a nice talk. I was wondering, to, it wasn't clear to me to what extent you put in the fact that you don't want the crunching solutions in the end and to what extent it actually mm -hmm. came out. That, that's my question and my comment is just that I think the mini superspace model you described in the end for higher dimensional uh, gravity, you can actually get it uh, as the full effective field theory in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. If you would look at charged uh -huh. black holes uh -huh. in the sitter space, which are close to their maximal charge, then the S2 is parametrically small with respect to the De Sitter 2, and I think you hmm. you essentially end up with JT gravity as effective field theory. But okay, that was just a comment. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, as far as the yeah, what is put in and what is uh, and what is there, um, I guess what I have in mind, at least in JT, is when we you know when we when we put the action into this form. I want, when I sum over metrics and dilettons, I still want to sum over non-singular metrics. And so the, the how to say, um, so in other words, I, what I really have in mind, what I'm really doing here is a Hamiltonian path integral, this is in Hamiltonian form, where I insert the restriction to sum over smooth metrics, and then in the next, uh, in these slides where I'm talking about it in terms of states, I'm interpreting those results in terms of states and operators. Uh, Henry? Sure. In this um, mini superspace, the picture you had of the potential, there's this regime of negative energy where the classical solutions bounce, but quantum mechanically you'd expect a, there's some probability that it'll tunnel through to a crunching solution. Does that, that might lead to a actually not even isometric piece, there's some exponentially small? This is a great question, I, something we're still thinking about. Okay. Where does the I epsilon come from? Um, there's uh, what happens, right. Uh, what you might ask that. Uh, there's the I epsilon. Okay, so this, this result for the amplitude, if you will, there's a, it's like the double trumpet. There's a, there's a, there's a trumpet corresponding to down here in the past. There's one up here, <coughs> and there's an integral over this, uh, the, the moduli of the cylinder. And what happens is, is that the, um, that, um, let me just remember how it goes exactly. There's, uh, instead of uh, being exponentially damped with alpha, it's oscillatory, I guess we're in to sitter, there's an I. And so the I epsilon is there to render that integral uh, exponentially convergent at large alpha. Where does that prescription come from? Oh, um, we. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying, we introduce it in order to render, uh, you know, we have, we, have, we have to make sense of all these, these integrals. We have to make them converge. So we introduce it in order to make the moduli space integral convergent. I'm, is, is that a satisfactory answer to you? Or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Quick question, in the last slide, what um, inner product do you use to take the norm of the hartle hawking state? There is this, there is the Clay Gordon one, I don't know. Uh, so the thing that we have in mind to do is an integral at future infinity, where the norm that we, so that's why this is a division by diff times vial, if we're at future infinity. Um, the norm that I have in mind that, that we're using, so I, I said earlier that the, the norm in JT that we're computing is, um, 
was uh, one where we have two asymptotic boundaries, but they're very, very close together. The norm that we have in mind here is the same kind of thing where we, if we wanted to compute the inner product over metrics, we would prepare two boundaries very, very close to each other. Um, there's still a non-trivial integral left to do, if you will, over um, fluctuations of the bulk stress tent of what you would identify in the boundary if we were doing ADS CFT as the stress tensor that leads to a delta function like norm uh, over the boundary metric. But you don't need to add it because I guess yeah, what I, what I, yeah. the one I had in mind was instead of taking yeah, yeah, the absolute yeah. value in the square, you take some kind of Klein Gordon. That yeah, sometimes it's I, used. if we were working uh, at finite at finite bulk time, I believe that would be the right thing to do. But ah, ah, okay, in, okay. in the far future, I ah, think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 